one. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you could be here with us for the uh, Keep It 100 teaching event. This track is the front lines track to give you the real skills, real concrete skills where the rubber hits the road when you are doing direct action and putting pressure on different targets to be able to win what you need to win for our campaigns. My name is Reverend Shauna Foster, and I'm so glad to be here with you today to give you the best of the education that we had during the election defender series and the frontline campaign throughout uh, voting and the congressional recess. This first 30 minutes are actually going to be two pre-recorded videos that are part of the trainings we did during the congressional recess action. The first video is by Pamela Campos Palma, who is the senior strategist and political advisor for the Working Families Party. She's going to be talking about how you do lobbying, because a lot of times people say, oh, you should lobby a target, but they don't tell you exactly what that means or what makes it effective. And so during Pam's video, I'm going to be in the chat pointing things out and talking to you the entire time. So please enjoy this video from Pam. And if you have questions, uh, you know, talk about it in the chat and understand she's talking about a specific action that we did during the spring congressional recess. But you can use those examples to apply it to your campaign goals. If we could get the video of Pam going now, that would be great. Hola a todos. Um, hi, everyone. I am honored to be with you all tonight, especially in this historic moment. Also, the frontline team is one of the most badass teams, and I'm just honored they asked me to be here. Um, my first time I had a lobbying meeting with an elected leader was nine years ago. I was thinking about this, and I so wish I had this training then. I was nervous, I wasn't sure of the protocols, but I fundamentally knew one thing. I belonged there. I belonged in those offices because we are the ones that we've been waiting for. Those offices are our offices, right? So if you remember anything, it's that we belong there. We have a duty to be there. I also very quickly learned very important, do not overlook staffers. This is something that a lot of folks do. And while you want to meet with your member of Congress, it's very important to not forget that staffers in those offices are the ones that make things happen and make things turn. They are themselves key people to respect. Um, and so I want you to remember these two things. It's our duty, we belong in these meetings. Um, we are powerful to be in these meetings. And tip number one, do not take legislative staff or front office workers for granted. And another tip I'll say up front is that often people think that when we're meeting with these folks, automatically it's, I'm talking to them. I'm just there to get my message across and I'm, it's a one way, I'm there to talk to them. But a really key thing to these meetings is to listen. Listen deeply and get information. Your group, you being there, uh, is a great opportunity to better understand the strategy of the office and the rationale um, so that you can continue to organize. And so as we go through this section, remember this. Um, listen, get information. So how do you get a meeting with your elected member of Congress? So all your members of Congress's contact information is publicly online. Um, but a key thing is when you look them up online, find their in-district scheduler information or their number to call or email. There's no shame in just calling several numbers and even asking, you know, can I get the scheduler's number? Um, Preferably, you want to call and talk to a live person to set up and schedule your meeting. That's preferable than shooting an email off and hoping that someone gets back to you. So when you call, it's very, very important that you identify yourself as a constituent because constituents have priority. And so you want to meet with your Congress member. To, be, to be, keep it 100, this is not a tall ask, right? To meet with your Congress member, that's what they're elected to do. And so this may sound obvious, but the office may try to get you to meet with an aide to protect that the Congress member's time. And you should push to meet with your elected official. The best and most effective way to do this is to be specific about who you are, 
right? So that you're a constituent, your group, and why you want to meet, whether that's defunding the police with the Breathe Act, creating green jobs for our people with the Thrive Agenda, and to make sure that they know we want to meet now, right? Not months from now. And so, you know, I'm just going to pretend that I'm doing this myself. So I call them and I say, hi, my name is Pam Campos Palma. I am a constituent of Representative Ceres uh, District here in New Jersey 8. I'm also a military veteran. Uh, given the dangerous white nationalist violence we've witnessed against our elections, I and fellow community members need to meet with the congressman to discuss passing critical democracy reform with HR1. I would like to schedule a meeting. When is the next available time the congressman can meet with us in person? And so uh, as a second best option, right, um, you could you, you if the if there's just no way that you can meet with your Congress member, um, I think we're on uh, so I, next. Uh, if you can't, if there's, they're, they're just like there's no way you can meet with the Congress person, they're just really not available. The second best option is to meet with the aide that works on your issue. This is very important. So, for example, if you and your group are pushing for rent relief. You want to meet with the aide that works on housing and advises the Congress member on housing issues, right? And so lots of elected officials, this is very key, lots of elected officials have a community engagement staffer. And a community engagement aide or staffer is someone whose job it is to meet with people like you, concerned constituents. And oftentimes this person is very polished in listening to you and telling you, you know, we'll bring this back. Thank you so much. You don't want to meet with this person because this person is, is, is necessarily not the person you need to meet with, right? Meeting with an aide is very strategic. It's almost, be meeting with the right aide is strategic almost as much so as meeting with the official themselves if you diligently ask for the right staffer, right? And so let's be clear. We are not doing this for practice. We are not doing this to signal, right? We want to be as effective as possible in this historic moment to pass legislative changes and get relief moved. And so sometimes the elected office may not have an aid on your issue. They might say, we don't have someone that covers that issue. Ask them questions, say, well, what are other areas? So you should think about other areas that intersect with your priority and ask them, what are the menu of options then of who can actually meet and who does this day to day, day in and day out and meet with that staffer and that aide. Most importantly, this isn't a one and done either, right? You want to develop a relationship with this staff worker um, who's actually advising. And in many times they're writing the policy for your elected. Um, and so think about it as relationship building. Because of COVID, um, electeds may not be holding in-person meetings in their office like they normally would. And so you should be prepared to think of, to ask about alternatives, right? So ask questions. How are their offices setting up their meetings? A big part of meeting with electeds is preparing for the meetings uh, so that you are confident and successful, right? So pre preparation and asking questions. So asking things like, what kind of meeting will it be? In what format? What can I expect? Is it a small round table with other leaders in the community, right? Or is it going to be an intimate meeting with just us and the aide? Is it at a Zoom on a scheduled time, right? That you need to like make sure you give make a reminder for yourself. Ask clarity and really importantly, be on time, be prepared. And so again, I said it and I'll say it a million times, preparation is key to being successful. Do some research on who you're meeting with, right? I like to ask, can you say their name again? Can you even spell it out? And I'll do some research on who that person is to understand where they might be coming from, like Nina said, so I can connect with them, right? And so think about what you're trying to bring to the meeting as well to show your power as well as your story of self, right? That it's not just you. So many of us are suffering from these ailments and these injustices. And so bring a petition 
pictures of people, um, you know, materials that you want to leave with their office. It's always great that you say, you know, here is a very simple sheet that we put together. So uh, with our points, right, notes for you in your office, it shows a real seriousness and it shows that you are powerful. And so if you go with a small group, this is another very key thing. Be super clear and prepare before who is leading the meeting and have a plan about how folks in your group are going to participate. The worst thing is to have it be confusing and awkward because people are talking over each other um, and you're stepping on each other, right? So have cohesion, organize beforehand. A group of people is key also to show that you're not alone and to also importantly have extra ears right, for listening and extra eyes. I love to assign one person in the group to be the note taker, right? So that we show also that we're listening to them. I sometimes have that person sit right in front of the staffer and take all the notes, right? So they know that we mean business and that we are taking this seriously as well. And also you want to debrief the meeting with your group, right? And so those notes help there too. And just so you know, the amazing frontline team has coaches that can help you with this if you choose to lead your meeting. And so next is the meeting. Um, oh, we're on the same slide. Be punctual. And even if your representative is Ted Cruz, right? Even if your representative is Ted Cruz, it is important to seek to build rapport, right? And so what this means is that I don't come out gun like blazing hot and hostile because Ted Cruz is the worst, as we know. I am gracious with the staffer, right? I am confident. I am charismatic. I am there with a purpose, right? I am not going to be shaken um, because of all of that. I'm there on a mission. And so the most important goals of your meeting, as Nina laid out, make a personal connection using your story in a powerful way that gets the legislator to hear you, right? And that gets them to see your community and the direct impacts that you're experiencing. Second, ask questions, get intel. What are their thoughts on this? Where do they stand? What blocks or barriers do they see in order to getting this passed? Even if somebody tells me, yes, I'm totally with you, great. I always ask what other colleagues, what other folks do we need to have on our side? Who needs encouragement? And get that intel from them, right? These are their coworkers. And then the final goal, Shauna said this, make an explicit ask. And so again, we didn't just come here to talk, we came here to make an ask on behalf of our communities. And next, I'm gonna go over a tool that can help you gauge how to move your decision maker. It's called the spectrum of allies. So this is the spectrum of allies. It's a tool that helps us, an organizing tool that helps us understand support and opposition. So active allies, you see them all the way on the left side. Active allies are people who agree with you. They are fighting alongside you actively. They are champions. Passive allies, the slice next to that, are people who agree with you, but they're not doing anything about it yet. They haven't really, you know, they agree with you kind of like in private, right? Neutrals are the folks in, in the middle slice um, are not actually in, they're not really engaged and they're uninformed, right? And so oftentimes the neutral folks, they're going to get pulled. They're going to do whatever, whoever's the loudest around them. And then passive opposition, the next slides are people who disagree with you, but they're not actively trying to stop you or organize against you, or they don't have funding against our, you know, our issues. So they're, they oppose us, but they're not really doing much about it. And then active opposition are people that not only disagree with us, but they're actively organizing against us or they're trying to undermine our message. And so as part of your preparation for your meeting, the reason this tool is so important is you want to use this tool to start assessing where this Congress member, your Congress member or this legislative office, where are they on this spectrum, right? Are they actively opposing you and very loud about it and public about it? 
Are they passive? Have your group have this understanding before you step into those into that meeting. It's also important because when you need to know how to move them and you most important of all, the spectrum of allies allows us to see what is realistic, right? Moving someone from active opposition all the way to, act, to active support, if you only have a one hour meeting is not realistic. So if your Congress member or aide is neutral, your goal is to compel them to support, right? If they're in that middle slice, you wanna move them to support. So you can say, our community is suffering. What are your concrete reasons for refusing to deliver for the communities you are supposed to represent, right? If they are passive supporters, you want to make them active public champions of our cause. So something I would say is we expect to be challenged on this in our own party or in our own state. We need you to be a champion out in front with us in this dire moment. We know we can win together, right? Compel them to stand with us in public actively. And while we don't expect this, if they are hostile and oppositional, it's always good to be prepared, right? Acting humble and curious goes a long way, right? Honey more than vinegar, I think is the same. Um, because again, you wanna listen to what their reasons are um, and really asking questions, right? So something I might say to someone who's hostile and oppositional to our group is, well, you mentioned most Texans don't want thousands of green jobs created Given the clear economic and climate crises our communities are experiencing, what makes you say this? What backup do you have to say this, right? Have them explain themselves to you. Another thing I might say is you keep citing certain constituents who agree with you, but I took time away from my family and my work to meet with you. Do you not feel that you represent my family and our community as well, right? The spectrum of allies, again, reminds us it is not realistic to move someone more than maybe two or three slices on this chart. However, do not forget, it is very important that we also move active opposition to neutral, right? Or at least slow them down, interrupt their logic. So we might say, um, that we, we at the front line, we don't expect that you'll encounter this in your lobbying meetings. We do ask you to be ready. Um, it could be that your representative has met with another constituency group that has convinced them to be hostile on this issue. So just in case, be prepared. You know, something that I, I often say, Navy kind of pointed this in her example is, you can just say out front, we can see that we are not going to change your mind today. But we will say that going directly against our community in this greatest time of need will not serve any of us. And in fact, your actions will only activate more members of the community to speak out in this historic moment, right? That makes them question if they're on the right side of history or freedom. So uh, the next slide, um, sometimes folks are, we have memories of, of this guy. Sometimes folks are really skilled at making you think that you had a great meeting, but actually nothing was promised, nothing was really heard, right? Don't let them give you non-answers. Don't let them give you circular, weaselly talk like this guy, right, around your ask. Ask them for a clear yes or no firm commitment to your agenda. And so if they do do some of this kind of dancing, weaseling, we like to say, be unafraid to stand your ground and say out loud, I don't really hear an answer here, right? Uh, be empowered to even repeat your ask. So I would say, with respect, Congresswoman, I don't hear a clear answer from you on this key economic issue that our working families count on you for. Will you, will you tell us right now that you will affirmatively be voting for the People's Act to make sure that we have structural democracy reform? Yes or no? and be comfortable with silence, even in that office. It's on them to answer you. Get a direct answer to your ask. And if they say, well, we'll get back to you, we'll get back to you, we'll look into this, ask them when that will be, right? Representative so-and-so, we need to know with certainty that you're on the side of working families in a time when we need you most. 
when exactly are you going to get back to us given that this boat is coming up soon? Right? And ask them for a real date and let them know you will also be following up, right? So overall, I would say nobody wants an agitational meeting. If you show up as a team, come prepared, practice your story of self. You know, we at the frontline practice grounding because it reminds us of our purpose and our values, right? And be well organized because you would be surprised at how you can actually get a hard commitment and key information from your Congress member or aide that actually delivers for our people. And if that happens, be sure to thank them, right? Um, this is not easy work. They probably meet with so many different people. So thank them. You know, optionally, you can ask to take a picture or a screenshot of your Zoom uh, to show, you know, say, I want to show the rest of our community that you stand with us and be proud of that. Um, and you can also say, I like to say, we look forward to working with you. We look forward to holding you accountable in community, right? In principled struggle. And so lastly, follow up, follow up, follow up. We know that's a, base, a key tenant to organizing. Follow up is important. And so work with your coach or your team to determine how will you follow up with the rep after the meeting. Make sure that they follow through with what you're asking. And I hope that this part of the training has been helpful to you. I'm glad to share in this yeah. knowledge. We're about to be done and I'm a Follow-up is important, and so work. Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. I was typing in the chat so many things that Pam was saying. Um, if you could follow along, some extra tips that were going on that that were going on. So <clears throat> that was a wonderful presentation by Pam. Thank you so much um, for that training. You can find that training on our YouTube channel, the Frontline um, YouTube channel, which we'll send out as an email as a follow-up to this teaching today, so that. If you want to share it with another team that you're getting together a lobbying meeting for, you can all watch it together, be trained together. Um, <clears throat> the next um, tactic I want to bring up, you know, lobbying is about um, building a relationship with the people who are in power to be able to move your issue in the way you want to. But sometimes uh, you're not going to want to build a relationship. A lot of times, um, this is things like corporate targets, right? Like there are just people you know, no matter how friendly you are, no matter how much you have a relationship with, they are not going to change their mind if you have a lobbying meeting with them. And so how do you build pressure? How do you disrupt the narrative that those people in power have over your issue? Um, and so this next video is about that. It's a tactic called bird dogging. It's when you go up to somebody um, who's in power, who's holding a press conference or some sort of public event and ask them a startling question uh, that is very hard for them to answer, but reveals that the framing that this person in power, that these people in power have been talking about this, the way they have been talking about it, is not right and you can represent your community. So this is a more of an escalatory tactic that happens after you have tried to build a relationship or you know a relationship is not possible and you want to really more expose that how they're framing the issue, how they're talking about the issue, is not really what's happening. So I'm happy to share a video with um, Tomas Kennedy uh, from United We Dream, who's going to share about the time that he successfully bird dogged Governor DeSantis about COVID and uh, what the circumstances were that led up to it and some tips about how to do this tactic of bird dogging well. If we could have Tomas on video, that would be so awesome. I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, I'm very excited to be with you all tonight. My name is Tomas. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. And I, uh, yeah, I serve as the uh, undeniable campaign manager for United We Dream. So I guess whenever we're ready, we'll watch the video. <laughs>
and we're getting record cases every day. Every day. Shame on you. You should reside on the campus. Reside. <laughs> yeah, so um, that was my moment with uh, uh, infamous uh, governor of Florida, uh, Ron DeSantis. So I guess uh, I'll start out by saying that um, that moment came pretty spontaneous. Uh, we have basically a squad like was that was just detailed uh, that basically is a rapid response uh, team here in Florida that's meant to basically track the uh, activities of elected officials, you know, that we know are not serving the people and that uh, need accountability. Ron DeSantis being, you know, the the chief culprit here in Florida. Uh, so, you know, we, in this WhatsApp group that we have, we basically are constantly sharing details of the schedule of these uh, elected officials, what they're doing, opportunities for bird dogging. And somebody basically put out his, his schedule for the day. And, we, you know, we knew that he was going to do that press conference at, at Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami with an hour or so notice. Uh, nobody could make it. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to drop what I'm doing because uh, I'm really pissed off. This was in June um, 2020, uh, you know, peak COVID, uh, peak of Florida, uh, you know, like record breaking cases, you know, no vaccine back then. Uh, you know, the, the government here was moving really slow. They were lying on the numbers. They were misleading the public. So I hopped in my car. Uh, I made sure that, you know, as, as was detailed, I, I called my folks. Uh, I called uh, uh, our, our communications people. You know, we were ready to share stuff. Uh, you know, uh, uh, in case I got arrested, I had people ready to bail me out uh, to support me. And I got to Jackson Memorial Hospital and I instantly started thinking, OK, like what's going to be my story? Right. Because I needed to get inside this press conference. So what I did is I went to the the, the, the security uh, 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 checkpoint and I told them that I was a blogger uh, and that I was there with the press. And I happened to have a, 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 a press, a press badge from an action that I was had participated in D.C. in 2018. It wasn't dated. And I showed this press badge for some reason, you know, like it, it all worked. They believed my story. I got in. I sat down there, tried to look, you know, not suspicious, inconspicuous um, and just waited um, until, uh, you know, the governor uh, walked in uh, with the mayor of Miami, who's another, you know, really scummy Republican, ex-mayor of Miami. Um, you know, and I, 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 I think it's important to like not jump the gun and, and uh, immediately do the action, but like let it sort of like let the moment sink in, let the uh, officials get like a, a little comfortable, look for the right moment, let the media get comfortable, make sure that all the cameras are rolling. And once I felt it was good, like 10, 10 minutes in or so, I got up and I did what I did. Uh, I think it's, you know, if you hear the video, I keep yelling the same things over and over. That's because, you know, in my head, I had built like a little script of what I wanted to say um, and what and the points that I really wanted to hit. Uh, and I was really focused on saying that because, you know, especially in the media, you're, you're only going to get a sound bite, right? You're only going to get like 15 to 30 seconds in. So you want to make sure that like the media is going to capture on what you're going to say and what you want them uh, to, to, to cover. Right. So it's really important that you like have a, 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 at least a little script or something that you know, you're going to say, um, even that little moment that I have where I tell the guy like social distance, um, that was actually like deliberate. Um, I thought of like adding it, uh, in there because a, um, I knew that they were going to do that. I wanted to highlight the lack of, you know, COVID concerns. And I thought it would be like, it would add like, a touch of humor that would help viralize the moment a little bit, uh, and it did. And I think that that you know that moment really went viral. It was covered by national publications, English, Spanish, uh, and you know. And I think uh, in terms of, of of why it was successful, um, and, and 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 you know why uh, it was impactful, is that uh, you know I love doing these sorts of things at press conferences because the media is already captured there, right? Like you don't have to send out a press release. You don't have to like get the media out there. They're already there. The cameras are rolling. They're ready to cover uh, the, the the event. 
And if you can derail it, the media loves it because obviously, you know, it's sensationalism. It's 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 a it's a viral moment. You know, it's it, it adds excitement. So uh, they they will uh, very likely uh, cover uh, you know your interruption uh, if, if you do it within the press conference. Another thing that's important here is that it disrupted the narrative about COVID that the governor's office wanted to portray. Right to the, to, up until that moment. Uh, the media had been very, very uh, lenient and not questioning with the with the governor's office and with the governor. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I went there, because I was frustrated by the lack of pushback and questioning uh, that the governor was receiving. So I wanted to basically disrupt the narrative and make sure that they weren't telling the story that they wanted to tell. Right. Uh, and in fact, uh, his communications director uh, at, at the time was fired uh, two days after this incident. Uh, and, you know, it, uh, it, it was said that this was one of the factors uh, that led to that, uh, this, you know, this, this, uh, this incident. And, you know, I'm, I'm not the type of person to get happy for anyone losing their job, but these people get paid to spell, to, to lie and mislead and do a lot of harm to our community, you know, so that's, that's a factor here. And then I just want to say that um, this named and shame uh, actors that can and should do better uh, for our communities, right? So um, uh, I think that's a really important factor here, right? That th these people that have been lying, that have been uh, serving corporate interests, that have been putting uh, people over profit time and again, you know, throughout their tenure, but during this public health crisis, you know, the consequences of putting um, sorry, profits over people uh, ha has deadly consequence, right? So again, what we were really trying to do with this action is um, again disrupt the narrative about COVID that the governor was trying to tell, and I think we were um, really successful in doing that. So then, you know, I just want to invite folks uh, to you know try this, you know, uh, confront these elected officials, shame them. Uh, disrupt their narrative uh, and you know again if you can do it uh, in a place where the media is already captured you know like the media will likely cover your story you know if they kick you out of the press conference they'll probably follow you outside and try to get an interview of what your side is you know so um, it's uh, I've just found that this tactic uh, is, is really successful so I just want to uh, thank you all for having me on to share, you know, this this story, this, uh, you know, this uh, direct action.
Hello, and thank you for joining us for this frontline track focusing on confronting white supremacy. My name is Sean, and I'm a member of the frontline education team. For the next 30 minutes or so, we will have a direct discussion around what it means to fight and confront white supremacy and fascism. I'm happy to introduce and bring into this discussion Daryl Lamont Jenkins. Daryl is the founder and executive director of One People's Project, a New Brunswick, New Jersey-based anti-hate organization that researches, monitors, and reports on right-wing groups and individuals that seek to mobilize <coughs> communities. Founded in, 2000, in the year 2000 and working under the motto, Hate Has Consequences, OPP has become a go-to resource on such matters and has been instrumental in the fight against hate. Jenkins has been profiled in the latest issue of The Progressive and is featured in the 2018 documentary Alt-Right, Age of Rage. Mike Coulter, Luke Cage, portrays him in the 2018 motion picture Skin, the true story about a neo-Nazi trying to break away from that life of hate, which also stars Jamie Bell, Daniel McDonald, and Vera Farmiga. Daryl, thank you for being here with us. And um, to, start this, to start this out, uh, really just want to first and foremost have you tell us about One People's Project and the amazing work that you all have been doing. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here, glad to talk to everyone. Um, One People's Project, as you said, started in 2000, July 4th, 2000, as a response to a white supremacist rally that was taking place in Morristown, New Jersey, about 45 minutes from here. Um, we started a website and we and the coalition of people that were that were going out to oppose that conference or rather that meeting rather um we basically used that to correspond with each other basically provide information about what was going on with the uh with the rally and who we were possibly going to be confronting and seeing at the at the event and afterwards we decided you know what we need to keep this momentum going we need to make sure that people understand what it is we were fighting out there what it is we are still fighting now and our initial and our initial um mission was to show the kinds of connections that lunatic fringe that far right had with the mainstream and i think that we over the past 20 years have been successful in that regard and in the course of the past 20 years, we've been able to um, get people to recognize exactly what it is we have been dealing with and neutralize that threat, diminish the ability for the far right elements in this society to function. And some, I mean, I've been called these past couple of months in one of the publications as the father of doxing. And part of the reason why was because we were one of the first people to just put up force organizations to just say, hey, look, here's everything about everyone. And that will range from your low level um, neo-Nazi in the street to Sean Hannity or Michelle Malkin. And we made no bones about it. We got the idea from um, anti-abortion activists who would publish the names and information of uh, abortion providers and if they got killed their names were stricken out of the um off their website and we said okay if it was their right to do so in that regard we'll do it and we are a lot more responsible so that so we like i said we've been around for about 20 years it'll be 21 in july and we have been pretty much the go-to source for a lot of the information that people are looking at today yeah, absolutely. Um, really thankful for the work that you all have done over the past two decades. Um, I definitely know that it has played a role in the work that I do locally um, here in eastern Tennessee and throughout mm -hmm. southern Appalachia. Um, and I, you have informed uh, my work in a, in a great way. So I'm really honored to yeah. have you here. Really uh, glad to have this discussion with you. Um, one thing that I would like to maybe start out with kind of in regards to this discussion is uh, discuss a concept that has really shaped uh, the way I think about anti-fascism in the U.S., and that is uh, the three-way fight. Um, can you explain to us what the three-way fight is and how it ties into the current political struggles for police and prison abolition, as well as pushing for a Green New Deal and electoral reform? Well, see, one of the things about fighting fascism is that the first and foremost thing that you have to recognize is that you are already a multifaceted person. You are fighting for something. You're not just going to be fighting against. 
So you're dealing with um, a lot of other concerns besides having to figure out how to neutralize those that um, create those concerns. You also have to make sure that we are building a better world for all of us. So a, th a three-way fight means that not only do you have to deal with the um, fascist forces that are out there um, in the streets that are basically um, running around as a paramilitary unit and what have you, the, um, you know, the standard fare when it comes to fighting fascism, but you're also going to have to deal with uh, the fascists of the state. We, they, they don't necessarily recall themselves that. They wouldn't even consider themselves fascists even if they were conservative or right wing. Um, but you have to deal with the fact that you are, um, that the state does put their boot on them, on us as a people, probably a lot more effectively than some of the folks you mess around with in the streets. I mean, yeah, we, it's, there's an old, there's a saying that you chant that you hear from time to time at all these rallies, the cops, the courts, the Ku Klux Klan, all are part of the boss's plan. There's something to that. <laughs> Very much so. As a matter of fact, it might mean we have a four-way fight because you have those street-level paramilitary Nazis. You have the co the cops in the courts that are the agents of the government, and then you have your robber barons, your your countless robber barons that are basically pulling the strings of the other two. So we have to recognize that as we go out there and try to deal with it. You miss one. The other's gonna stab you in the back or kick you in the behind, whatever whatever analogy you want to use. So we have recognized this as antifa. We have recognized this as anti-fascist and say, look, it's all one attack. We have to um, we have to recognize it for what it is, and that will make us that will make us a lot more effective in what it is we do. And I'm gonna tell you something: when you look at how the fascists operate in this day and age. They're doing that too. That's why they're busy trying to reach out to us so we can fight that common enemy, you know, the government or whatever. When in truth, they are just as much the enemy as the government. Um, we recognize that. They hope we don't. Unfortunately, we do have folks out there that don't recognize that and think that they can work with the Boogaloo Boys or... or um, or with some neo-Nazi even in the course of um, fighting against what's going on, what we're bringing to the Middle East, for example. You know, they don't, they refuse to recognize it and that can even cause more problems and it does cause more problems. Um, you, you have individuals, I mean, I mentioned the Boogaloo Boys and they've been um, pretty active in trying to unite with Black Lives Matter with BLM. And I have been pushing back on that. They say, incidentally, um, that their biggest opposition in, in those efforts has been Antifa. There's a reason for that. Antifa is not putting up with it. They recognize it for what it is. And, and we have seen it before. We have seen it before throughout history in this country, in this society. It's what built this country. You know, I mean, I, I'd like to make the point that, yeah, um, now, recognizing, recognizing that, yeah, uh, we are talking about the colonialists of um, 200 years ago when I say this, that I'm cognizant of that um, and what they have done to the indigenous people here. We, um, we are talking about farmers who were frustrated over the fact that their money was going to a monarchy 3,000 miles away that didn't have anything to do with what was going on on these shores. So along comes Thomas Paine, recognizing those concerns, recognizing those frustrations to say, you know what, we may need to build something beyond them. And he started publishing his pamphlet, Common Sense. It became a very popular thing amongst the working class here. And along comes the so-called founding fathers who say, yep, here's our opportunity. We can take, we can seize upon this and make it our own. And the end result after the revolution, those farmers, those um, working class people weren't even allowed to, to shape the government, weren't allowed to vote, weren't allowed to be a part of the government. Um, they were suckered. 
they were flat out suckered. That's why you have to be mindful of when that three way fight comes from their direction. When it comes from us, everybody prospers. When it comes from them, no one does except right on. them. Right on, right on. Yeah, I think uh, absolutely agree with you. Um, it really brings to mind just the importance of intersectionalism within our struggle. Um, it's not just the fascists, it's not just the Klan here in the U.S. South, but it's it's as much the politicians, the landlords, and the cops. So really appreciate you uh, driving that point home for us and kind of framing the rest of this conversation. Um, I kind of want to move a little bit um, to just your recent history, you know, um, and we saw what was an unprecedented open white supremacist uh organizing during the Trump administration, right? Those four years really felt like things kind of came out front. People quit saying the the quiet things uh, or started saying the the secrets out loud or whatever. Um, This culminated in the attempted coup at the Capitol. Um, Since that time, Trump has been deplatformed. There have been hundreds of arrests of his supporters. Um, And as we discovered, right, there were police, there were former military and current military that were part of that. What does white supremacist organizing and activism look like kind of post-January 6th? What is it that we are now having to confront and face under the Biden administration and looking towards 2022 and 2024? Well, I can always I always tell people that your template is going to be how we handle things after Charlottesville, how things look after Charlottesville. Um, the difference, however, between Charlottesville and January 6th is that January 6th was um, a little bit more closer to the power. You know, we saw the cops, the courts, and the Ku Klux Klan trying to storm the Capitol on January 6th. (laughs) Let's just be real. And for us to see it get to that level informed us as to what it is we are dealing with now. So why I say that... um, Charlottesville was the temple because what happened after Charlottesville? We got proactive against that white supremacist element. We started really just deplatforming them all over the place. Um, you couldn't even work at a hot dog stand without getting fired from it once they found out that you went to Charlottesville. Um, I know one guy who was disowned by his family. You know, I mean, this, that's the kind of thing that was happening. A lot of your um, websites that were really in the forefront, a lot of their websites that were in the forefront all of a sudden didn't have um, a platform anymore. Their um, providers just yanked them, you know. And what they did in response was just simply rebrand. Identity Europa became the American identity movement. People are getting sued. People were getting arrested, you know. So they basically, so a lot of them said, you know what, we're not doing public rallies anymore. Um, This is just causing us more problems than it's worth. And if they do do the um, public rallies, um, as um, Identity Europa eventually showed us, they do it in the form of flash mobs. You know, so so what's going to happen in January 6th? The same thing. It's not going to happen yet. You might see something start to rumble in the um, summertime. But for now, what they have done was um, what the other side has done was lay low. Um, Go to um, safe states like Florida or what have you um, and basically just try to regroup and um, just they just talk trash online. That's pretty much what we have seen. And once again, we started deplatforming all of these individuals. All of a sudden, QAnon is verboten. QAnon was the rage until January 6th. Um, The Proud Boys. Proud Boys were already um, in on borrowed time to begin with. The moment that he, moment that the Proud Boys were mentioned in um, in presidential debates, that was the end of them. They just basically expedited everything after January six. The Proud Boys themselves did that. So it's going to be a case of we got just as we have been vigilant against them in. Um, and after Charlottesville, we're going to be just as vigilant against them after January 6th and have been. They are just going to try to figure a way to circle their wagons um, and keep themselves from getting into too much more trouble as they try to go forward. And that's one of the reasons why I would say, yeah, these events might not be happening in your towns um, or in your states. The conferences like um, we have seen that 
take place in Florida or the rallies that we've seen in Florida, but it's still going to be relevant to what happens in your state. There is at least one, I should point this out, there is at least somebody from Act for America, his name is Scott Pressler, an anti-Muslim activist who tries to sow division between, um, in particular, Blacks and Hispanics. Um, he's going around the country and he's probably in your neighborhood now trying to organize. And he had, and he's on a tour right now doing that. So that gives you an idea of what it is um, they're trying to do. They're trying to make things happen again. So just being on the lookout for it. Yeah, absolutely. I also, yeah, I feel like there's a lot of movement at the state level uh, pushing far right uh, policies and, and um, laws for that uh, maybe they can't do at the federal level at this time too. So there's lots of things to keep in mind and to be on the lookout for. One thing that you mentioned was the effectiveness of deplatforming. So to kind of tread lightly here into some of the, the cultural war, um, we hear conservatives, talking heads, uh, just the, you know, for some people, the next door neighbor, kind of bemoan the idea of cancel culture. Um, can you tell us what they mean when they talk about cancel culture and what role does deplatforming play in resisting fascism and white supremacy? As um, It's funny how we are complaining about cancel culture, to be honest, because it's only um, the complaints are only coming because the right have been the victims of it as opposed to being the practitioners of it as they have been. We've seen what happened to folks who were anti-war 20 years ago. We saw what happened to the Dixie Jets. We saw what happened to Colin Kaepernick. We saw what happened to Kathy Griffin, you know. Um, and let us not um, forget about the fact that when they pass these anti-voting laws, that's cancel culture. So um, we can go on forever and ever and ever about what the right has done to continue the um, idea of cancel culture, but when it's done to them, then there's the problem. Cancel culture is basically seeing, and I have to, um, I have to preface this by saying I've been on a couple of television shows um, to discuss this particular issue. So if I drop a name, there's a reason for it, um, because um, I got into this with Piers Morgan on the Dr. Phil show about a, a couple of months ago. And it was just a couple of weeks before he deplatformed himself. He canceled himself by getting angry when somebody um, called him out live on television. He just walked off the set and they call and, and the right to their um, as they are called that cancel culture. Nope, it isn't. And basically what I had been saying all along is that, look, you can take it out of the political. If I don't want to have anything to do with you, I will not. If I want to tell everybody why I won't have anything to do with you, I will. And if they agree with me, so be it. I mean, that's just the way it goes, whether you um, are talking about politics or not. Um, so it is not a bad thing. It is what we do. It is how we survive. It's how we live. If you don't want, if you find something objectionable, say so. Do not let the current um, climate prevent you from doing that. Um, I think to um, basically underscore a fact, when you hear the complaints about cancel culture, and it's ultimately a red herring, and it ultimately means that the right does not want to be held accountable for the damage that they do to a society. I think it's, um, I think somebody put it best when they referred to cancel culture as consequence culture. Yep. Ultimately, that's what it is. Yeah, I feel that. I feel um, it's it's a buzzword uh, to to drum up a base, but really, it's just accountability, right? Accountability for right. your actions, accountability for the things that you have to that you say, um, so on and so forth. So, I'm glad that you uh, kind of put that out there. I think that that could probably cause some discomfort in folks that that don't understand how it is that anti-fascists in particular have used deplatforming as such an effective tool when confronting white supremacy and things that we can integrate into a broader coalition into a broader front front as we continue to move and fight against white supremacist culture fascist culture and and to like where we're at in this kind of police state of, a, of the united states um the next question that I have for you is just that, um, you know, deplatforming is one is is one skill that we bring to the table. 
But um, I feel like we kind of are always on a constant defensive. Um, we're always in reaction to something something new going on, right? Like we've had a pandemic, we've had a coup, um, we have uh, mass shootings, we have all these things taking place uh, in the United States right now. And and as you kind of alluded to earlier too, things may pick up in the summer as um, you know a traditional fighting season across the the globe, really. So how do we move from being on the constant defensive to taking a, a hold of the new reality of what, you know, at least uh, hopefully, you know, much longer than the next two years. But as we as we fight, like w- the new reality of a democratic presidency and democratic control of Congress and how do we uh, kind of go on the offensive against white supremacy? I think um, one of the things I like whenever I'm speaking to um, groups, I always make sure that I end each um, speech or discussion with a call to just basically enjoy what you are fighting for. Appreciate the things that you are fighting for. Um, Don't just go out there and be this um, robot against the state or against the fashion, whatever. At the end of the day, you end, you are fighting for something. Learn to just basically appreciate it, and it'll make you. It will basically give you peace of mind in many respects, you know. And I think one of the ways to do that is exactly what it is we need to do anyway. We need to build our own institutions. We this is our way of going on the offense. Um, we need to um, make sure, and I don't necessarily mean anarchists or Marxist institutions, just institutions that respond to the concerns that we have when our governments or when our people in power do not. We don't have to wait for them. So if you find somebody that's in need of food, start a food bank, start a kitchen, you know. If you find um, that education is lacking in an area, start a school, (laughs) you know. These are the things, these are the ways you build your institutions and you build up your institutions, you build up your own institutions and you will find that when the time comes, when all of this nonsense starts trying to um, to build up, it either may not have the ability to do so because that work that you're doing, or you will have a better um, ability to fight whatever it is they're doing because because you, you will also bring more people, people who aren't necessarily politically minded for that matter, um, on to your side because they recognize that you're doing work and they're not. You're doing work and they're trying to take it down. More to the point, we are all doing work and they want to shut all of us down. So that is, that's what it is we have to do. That is, um, and I, I'm going to tell you something. When people talk about um, Democrats and Republicans and all that, one of the things we got to recognize is the fact that this political process that we have in this country is corrupt. We're trying to fix it, but it's hard. We have third parties. We have independents that are leagues better than whatever it is the Democrats and Republicans have to offer, but we can't get them in those positions right now. But we will. In the meantime, we have to address our concerns. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what Occupy was about 10 years ago, trying to build up those institutions and those alternatives to a corrupt political system. So if we could do it 10 years ago, and by the way, they basically tried to shut it down. They did shut it down. But that wasn't the end of it, as we see 10 years later, still talking about it. We're not talking about the tea parties, (laughs) but we're still talking about Occupy. So recognize what that was and bring it and bring it back a little bit more. You'll see things change. And we have seen things change in the past when we did that. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's there's power in solidarity. And um, I have definitely seen firsthand the way in which meeting people where they're at, providing mutual aid um, is a way to move people and a way to have a material impact on uh, individuals lives and uh when we talk about and think about infrastructure we're on a call that's built on around these concepts this idea of a different dual power infrastructure um either at the front line with the working families party movement for black lives and so on um so i I think it's there i think we're, we're we're working on it and again just 
this is a this is a long fight, so we need to keep with it. Um, long fight, we can make it shorter if we do what we need to do. We just got to maintain vigilance against against the stuff that we're fighting and for the stuff that we want. Yeah, absolutely. I think we have time for our, about two more questions. So um, what I want to do is just ask this next question, which is. Uh, during the movements against police brutality and the uprisings for Black Lives this summer, or this past summer, Antifa became a household name. How do you see, or not see, progressives unwittingly holding up right-wing narratives and conspiracies about Antifa? And are some, and what are some common misconceptions progressives have about anti-fascist work? That they are not Antifa themselves. <laughs> That's what, that's first and foremost. When they say, listen, they want to try to criminalize Antifa, they want to try to criminalize Black Lives Matter. My response to that is basically what they're trying to do is tell you that you are a criminal if you are anti-fascist and believe that Black Lives Matter. You already know right then and there to ignore all of that rhetoric. You just got to keep pushing and you got to keep fighting. You got uh, and look. They do this. This propaganda is the order of their day. That's all they do. This nonsense about Antifa, complaining about Antifa, it's going to go away. It's going to go away. But people recognize Antifa for what it is. Have faith in that. Um, it just doesn't look good optic-wise. If you don't care about the optics, you can get a lot of stuff done. <laughs> <laughs> so don't care about the optics. The optics are basically trying to deal with a house of cards. <laughs> yeah. You're fighting a house of cards. <laughs> and you're a brick house. <laughs> so don't worry about what it is they do. Oh, insofar that you do have to worry, you just have to make sure that you can lessen the damage that they cause in the interim. So that's one of the reasons why you have to push back on it a lot more than um, we have lately. But Rhetoric coming from Fox News doesn't phase me. It never has. I mean, my um, the, my group's uh, main address is Antifa at OnePeople'sProject.com, and we've had that since 2001. So, <laughs> so we don't care. <laughs> we yeah. do not care, and no one else should. Just continue doing as we do. We know who they are, and most importantly, we know who we are. Right on, right on. Anti being an anti fascist is not a slur. And um no. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think we've seen a lot of really, really good work come out of it. So Yeah, no um, need to go into the defensive. Just need to make sure people understand where we're at <laughs> with yeah. all this nonsense. Okay. I this last question then I think is kind of in line with that. Um so the again, there are a lot of people that may have talked bad about it, but there are also a lot of people that saw the value in the work that you and other longtime anti-fascists have done in identifying and monitoring the far right groups. So how is it that people that are not as involved in anti-fascist organizing plug in and help? And how can electoral organizers both utilize that work as well as critically support it? Well, it's basically it's important to recognize the fact that we don't have to lie. Anti-fascists realize that we don't have to get bogged down in propaganda. And when I say propaganda, I just mean things that are just trying to sell you to a point, regardless of whether or not it's 100% accurate. You know, We don't have to do that as anti-fascists. We can basically just show you exactly what it is that's going on out there, and it will be true. <laughs> so when you go to an organization like One People's Project or even Rose City Antifa and all that, you pretty much are going to learn who it is that we are dealing with, why it is they're a problem, and how it is to neutralize them. So all the information that you get from, so basically the way to fight these, um, these elements is with truth. It's that simple. And when it goes, when it comes out there, when it gets out there, just just keep on pushing the truth forward. Let everybody see what you see and what we have written and what we are um, putting out there. I mean, you don't have to necessarily, you don't even have to put, if you're worried about the optics, put the anti-fascist name on it, put the Antifa name on it. Just say, look, regardless of where the, who the source is, you still know that the information is on point. You can always check to make sure that's what's important. I mean, if people want to try to attack the source, frankly, 
if you want to keep complaining that Antifa is the ones that this came from and it's all accurate, you just gave Antifa props. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's what's that's how you utilize it. Read it. Decide for yourself how read the information that we put out there, because that's really all we're about. Decide for yourself what direction that you are going to go in with that information. And then take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, with the American First Caucus that's in the Congress right now, there are fascists. Mm -hmm. There are people that um, identify with that or in the circles with those folks. So uh, open source uh, information coming from anti-fascists can be used in the electoral realm as much as it can be in the community defense realm. Um, And this is obviously something that we can talk about for an extremely, like, we're much longer than 30 minutes. Um, but it looks like we've kind of reached the end of our, our track here. I want to say thank you so much for, for joining us for this call. It's been really great talking with you. It's been really great planning and, and getting ready for this. So thank you for the knowledge that you brought and all the work that you do and will continue to do. Thank you. Absolutely. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Frontline Track. Thank you so much for spending your lovely spring Saturday afternoon with us. My name is LJ, I use she and her pronouns. I am here in Brooklyn, New York on occupied Lenape territory, and I am so proud to be a training coordinator here at the Frontline. Uh, So today I'm going to talk to you about de-escalation Q slide, please. All right, so here to talk about de-escalation. Um, we're gonna start real quick, just on a practical legal note. Next slide with a little disclaimer that just says, hey, I'm not a lawyer. This isn't legal advice. 
Um, and also, I can't guarantee that you can be completely safe using my suggestions. So what I'm going to offer you is um, some techniques and wisdom that I have gathered over the past 15 years as a direct action organizer and hope that you can use these in typical situations, right? We're not going to cover every situation um, or very extreme situations, but hopefully if you follow some of these guidelines and suggestions, things won't escalate to uh, an extreme situation. Next slide, please. So today's agenda is that we are going to practice some situational awareness, talk about what de-escalation is. I'm going to show you this cool tool called SALT. We're going to talk about managing yourself and then managing your situation, managing the situation at hand, and then go through some verbal de-escalation techniques. And I'm just going to end with a, a short word on getting creative and the wonders that humor can do in difficult situations. Next slide, please. So we're going to start off with a game that I invented in the Zoom era uh, to get you to practice situational awareness. So situational awareness is two things. First, it's being aware of your surroundings and practicing peripheral vision. Second, situational awareness is being able to remember things that you only saw briefly. So lots of times we walk around during the day like do 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 on my phone, let me check my Instagram, let me just make sure not to trip, do 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 do. But then we show up in very high stress situations um, like polling locations or at protests. And we need to flip that switch on, right? And turn on our situational awareness because things might happen and we're flooded with stimuli. So situational is a muscle. So I want us to work it out together a little bit. So here's how the game goes. I'm gonna show you a picture and you're gonna have three seconds to look at it. Then you're gonna tell people in the chat box what you saw. So tell us as many things that you remember seeing in just those three seconds, okay? So uh, first up, we're gonna look at an image and next slide, please. Okay, three seconds here. What do you see? We're in the jungle. Three, two, one, next slide, perfect. Okay, so can you please throw some stuff into the chat box? Tell us what you saw, what you remember. Okay, so I'm seeing Ross from Arizona said he saw some butterflies and flamingos, monkeys, a waterfall. Did anybody ever see any other animals? Right, there were some trees, there were some parrots, lots going on in that scene. So we're gonna look at another image. We're gonna play the same game. So next slide. All right, we're here in some weird British eccentrics, haunted greenhouse. What do you see? Three seconds. Okay, next slide. Lots going on here, right? What did you see? Kathy Lynn. What did you see? Okay, there was like a knight and there was a, there was like an old gown, a treasure chest, okay? Lots happening in that scene. So feel free to throw anything in the chat box and then I wanna go and move to one more image. So next slide, please. Now here we're at an actual polling location in Pennsylvania. So everybody take three seconds, notice as much as you can. What might go wrong? Where might there be confusion? What do you need to keep tabs on? Okay, so what did you see there? It was a lot to take in. Want to shout out Kathy Lynn who noticed the glowing door and the dinosaur in the last image. Shout out Kathy Lynn, right? So then we get to the polling location and it's actually not all that different from the crazy jungle scene, right? 
there's a complicated line, there are security guards, right? There's a lot happening. Um, and I think that you guys see where I'm going here, right? Is that we, these high stakes situations like protests or voting, there's a lot happening. And so when people ask me what de-escalation is, I like to say that it's prevention. It's being able to see and absorb what's around you, being able to take lots of things in and just being a good human who can be available to help sort out any confusion or interrupt any potential conflict or frustration. So next slide, please. Right, so de-escalation is about interrupting tension. So if you can't prevent it, be prepared to interrupt it. Please let go of your desire to resolve any conflict. We all know from our own lives with parents and family and friends and, and partners that resolving conflict can take a little while, right? So let go of your instinct to try to make everything better and just focus on interrupting the conflict. Um, create safety where you're able to, right? Be a manager. You really need to live into, into yourself as like a manager, right? You're not here to play arbiter of who's right and who's wrong. You're just here to create as much safety as you can. And so I really like to talk about de-escalation as a practice of grounding, because when something happens, something pops off, tensions really rise. And, every, and everyone's attention just zooms in to the thing that is happening, to the conflict. Maybe there's a confrontation between police and a protester, but there's this moth to a flame situation. And so what you wanna do is just kind of help ground the situation by grounding yourself, grounding the people you're here with, whether it's bystanders, whether it's just your neighbors voting, right? Just try to bring the energy back down so the energy is not all over the place, right? Because you can't bring an agitator or an agitated person into a grounded place unless you are already grounded yourself. Next slide, please. So I like this. I really like, I really like this. I like to call de-escalation vibes management, right? You're just here to make sure that the energy is good, that energy is safe, and that people are feeling empowered and powerful, right? To take action, whether it's at a protest, whether it's at a polling location, or maybe you're just on the subway, right? Things happen in public space all the time, especially in this moment um, uh, where there's so much at stake, right? So de-escalation is vibes management. Next slide, please. Okay, so you might be in any situation, right? And somebody is agitated. I think it's important that we not assume that everybody is always trying to do harm. A lot of times people are showing up with hurt feelings. There's confusion or frustration. I think the experience just of being not listened to can be very, be very provocative to us, right? Um, but also the reality is, and as Daryl and Sean were just talking about, there are some people that want to do harm. So it's important that we assess agitators. Um, the reason that it's important for us to assess agitators is that when we feel threatened or scared or small, our emotions go into overdrive. And then we can't actually assess the situation accurately. Even in really small, small situations, like the other day I was, I was trying to work and outside there was some construction happening and it sounded like there were 50 jackhammers because I couldn't focus and I was getting very frustrated. It was really only one jackhammer and two workers who were just trying to do their job. But even in normal situations, when, we, when an emotion kicks in, we no longer see the situation as it actually is, right? So we wanna be able to do an accurate assessment for ourselves, but also so that you can communicate to other people, right? You should never try to do de-escalation at a protest alone. 
So have a team member, and this is a really handy tool to communicate to your team member what's actually happening. And this tool is called SALT, and shout out to Sean for, uh, for teaching me this tool. So SALT is just an acronym for this assessment. So the S is for size. How many people are there and who are they, right? If I call up Ace and I say, can you get over here? There's a, there's a big group of scary guys. That doesn't really give him a lot of information, right? So size, how many people are there and what are they and who are they? The A is for activity. What are they doing? And actually, I think that this is the thing that we are most unable to articulate when we are scared or feel threatened, right? Uh, examples of activities could be people are circling voters with signs. People are um, driving around the parking lot, right? Um, people are yelling, but then they're leaving and then they're coming back and yelling again. So try to be specific about the activity. The L is for location, right? Where, where are the agitators right now? And if possible, where did they come from and where are they going? And the T is for time, right? Time is another thing that gets a little bit loose when we are in our feelings. Right? Uh, and everybody knows this. When you're feeling scared. Time can feel like it's really long, even if it's just five minutes. So take a note, look at your, your phone or your watch. What time did the people show up? How long have they been here? This kind of information is really helpful to communicate um, to your team members or just your friends or whoever you're out there with. So next slide. So managing yourself. So as I said at the beginning, you can't accompany anybody who is agitated into that calm space if you are not already in that calm space. Um, a friend of mine once told me, nobody ever calms down from being told calm down. And it's totally true, right? So you have to start with yourself and kind of embody that grounded energy. You can't diffuse a situation if you are not already there. So before you intervene in anything, check in with yourself. And so here's a way to do that. It's called the ABCs. Next slide, please. So the ABCs, A is just assess yourself. Am I prepared to intervene? Do I feel confident enough? Do I feel grounded enough? Do I need to actually ask somebody else to come over and provide some support? Because maybe I'm not, I'm not in a headspace right now to be able to interrupt some conflict. If I do decide that I am the right person to intervene, right? The, the second thing I'm gonna do is breathe. Count to 10, slow down your breath and remember why you're here. Identify a goal for what you wanna do. My goal is to get these two people to stop shouting at each other. And then my second goal is to get that woman over there to go back to her car, right? Have a concrete goal. Cause otherwise, if you just start intervening and you don't actually have a goal, things can go off the rails pretty quickly. The C is for choosing, choosing how you get involved, right? Don't just run out of instinct. We all have a fight, a flight or a freeze reaction. Mine is the fight reaction. I am very quick to intervene. So really be thoughtful about choosing how to get involved. Then we're gonna de-escalate. Uh, we're gonna talk about that next. And then I added the E to escalate only if this helps reach your goal. And I'll give you an example. I was in Washington DC shortly before the pandemic. There was a protest happening and there were two really big guys who were getting into it, right? I'm not a very big person, I'm a woman. I don't think people find me particularly threatening. And so I was able to come in there and actually raise my voice, right? Uh, and try to break them physically apart. 
Um, but the way I was able to escalate because neither of those guys would see me as a threat. Um, so you want to be thoughtful about escalating, about when you raise your voice, about when you assert power, because it can be strategic to do so, but you also don't want to come out there and embody the kind of toxic behavior of the police um, or of, the, of, uh, of like a kind of oppressive energy, right? That the, is the one that we're actually trying to, to fight against. So next slide, please. So managing the situation, right? Uh, situational awareness is the first step in this, is knowing all of the different factors in the situation, right? So once you're there, let's say we're at a polling location, we want you to know, huh, it feels like the, there's some confusion around which way the line is. Or it sounds like there, some people are frustrated from being from standing on line for too long. So you want to already know what the factors are that could cause a situation to escalate. So um, some ways of managing the situation we're going to talk about. Next slide. But first is to not lose sight of why you're here. Remember why you're here, whether it is a protest or a polling location, or it's just a community event or an organizing meeting, right? Focus on the people you're fighting for, not the people you're fighting against, right? We spend a lot of our time already during the day reading news about the alt-right, reading about Trump supporters. Thankfully, I think we're starting to actually let go and shed some of that obsession with the news and Trump, um, but focus on who you're fighting for and remember that, that creating conditions of safety for them is ultimately your goal and to not get caught up in the noise of people um, that might be provocative or, or agitational. So take care of your team, take care of the bystanders, right? Take care of the people um, that you're here to help uh, stand in solidarity with. So what to say to your team when people are getting scared or, agitate, or agitated or frustrated or feel threatened? Always affirm people's feelings, right? People need to know that what they're feeling is real. You know, I hear you and it is so real to be scared right now, right? Just affirm that what they're feeling is real. Try to create a situation of distraction. Can you talk to somebody about what's happening? Can you tell me about the new puppy that you just got, right? Are there topics that feel less loaded to talk about um, that can help calm people down? What would you tell me is a phrase that actually I use a lot in my personal life with my partner, which is if I were feeling freaked out or overwhelmed, what would you tell me? Another technique of taking care of your team is flipping the script, right? Can you help me? So somebody who is feeling helpless in a moment, all of a sudden can like completely change that energy by being asked to be helpful. So if I'm feeling helpless and Shauna comes over and says, hey, can you, can you help me actually move all these signs and these banners over there? All of a sudden I have shifted out of this helpless place into a place of actually feeling powerful again. And always refer to established norms, you know? Established norms can be things like, you know, we don't raise our voice here or over here we use people's pronouns that they that they that they use um you know we're here to because uh you know because we want to protest um but we're not here because we're trying to get into you know scuffles in the parking lot refer to the established norms is a technique of bringing people into something that's larger than themselves Next slide, please. So now the real meat and potatoes of de-escalation. So 
direct intervention, right? Something is happening. I have assessed myself. I'm breathing. I'm grounded. I'm ready to intervene and to interrupt. Always use non-threatening body language. I'm a big, I, I like to talk with my hands a lot. Sometimes that can be too much. So just try to be relaxed, grounded, use active listening, and then really pay attention to the volume you're speaking at. Try to speak slowly, clearly, right? Don't move too quick, especially with your hands, because somebody who's agitated then might be provoked. And also, like, just don't talk politics, maybe, right? I think that that's the hardest thing to remember is that especially when someone maybe has opposing viewpoints, it's so easy to get sucked in to the debate. Avoid the debate. And if direct intervention isn't the strategy you're choosing, go with delaying. Wait it out. If somebody is not, uh, if you don't feel like somebody is about to explode or that the situation's about to get out of hand, just try to wait it out. Distraction is another really key strategy, right? Whether it's that bystanders are getting involved or somebody is just, you know, kind of getting in your face, um, create uh, a distraction and direct attention elsewhere. Delegating. So this is the can you help me moment. Work with a buddy or with allies. We talked a lot about this in preparation for the November election of getting voters involved, right? Hey, can you help pass out water? Can you help pass out hand warmers? Can you lead people in a chant, right? Delegating is so important. And especially if something does get out of hand, you're not going to be able to handle it yourself. So make sure that you're recruiting other people so that it's a team effort. Create some physical distance between you, bystanders, and the problem, right? If you can just move people along in the march, if you can move people to other end of the subway car, sometimes the easiest thing to do is just to create some space. And then always, when possible, document, right? Know that showing up and having your camera in someone's face can be very provocative. But if you do feel like something needs to be documented because you might need to give it to a lawyer or you might need to show it to um, uh, other organizers that you're working with, document. And if possible, let that person know that you're documenting them because it's very possible that someone will adapt their behavior knowing that now all of a sudden they're on camera. Next slide, please. We have about six minutes. So. People are always like, OK, but what actually do I say? What actually do I say? And I like to leave this till the end because 92 percent of the communication that we do with other people is through our body language, is through our tone of voice. It's why we talk to babies in this exaggerated way. Oh, are you cute? Because we're trying to communicate information without actually relying on words. So I like to leave this till the end. So next slide, please. So these techniques are based off of your ability to assess uh, somebody else's emotional state and then to meet them in a place uh, that helps diffuse that. So if somebody is exhibiting fear, offer help, right? I can help get you some more clarity on whether this is your polling location, or I can help escort you away from the protest. If somebody is showing frustration, offer empathy is first and foremost. Nobody likes to be frustrated, but also offer some firm boundaries, right? I can see that you are frustrated. I want to help you, but I am unable to leave my team right here, right? Or I am unable to um, uh, you know, to to talk to you for much longer. Hold your boundaries when somebody is frustrated; otherwise, things can spiral. 
If you feel like somebody is trying to manipulate you, this could be somebody who's an all like agitator. It could be a police officer, you know? Um, this is the moment to channel your inner DMV clerk. Practice detachment, right? Don't be rude, but just also like emotionally divest from the situation. Just be matter of fact, right? This is what I saw and just repeat it over and over again. Don't, don't let your emotions um, fuel the conversation. And then if what you're facing is intimidation, right? If somebody's trying to be intimidating, if someone's trying to be intimidating, excuse me, um, uh, remind people of consequences, right? I feel like you are trying to intimidate me and I just want you to know that there are a lot of people right here who are observing what you're doing. So I don't want you to be outright threatening because that's just not our style. Um, but it is important to remind people that that things have consequences and actually shout out to Daryl for talking about how hate has consequences, right? Uh, so I really appreciate that framing, Daryl. Next slide. So some things that are always useful to have in your toolkit de-escalation. Just start right off the bat by introducing yourself and asking somebody their name. Because I could then immediately am LJ, this person is immediately Ross, and there's no more, you know, me versus you. All of a sudden we're humans together, right? Start documenting if you feel like things are going to escalate and remind somebody that, that you are documenting. Naming the behavior is a very important verbal de-escalation technique because it's not about interpretation or demonizing somebody. Name somebody's behavior looks like you're raising your voice at me or you are standing too close to me, right? not you're being mean. <laughs> I was going to say something else just then. Uh, but, but uh, right. So name the behavior and put and establish norms. I've already talked about this. And then give options. So for anybody feeling overwhelmed, and I'm sure many of us can relate to this just in our normal lives, when you feel overwhelmed, it's so much easier to have options. Would you like a glass of water or would you like to maybe take a walk and we can talk about what's bothering you, right? Give options so that people can, can immediately see themselves getting out of that escalated place. Next slide, please. And then lastly, get creative, you know? I can tell you from years of experience that of race and patriarchy and sexism and homophobia when there's when there is a, a conflict happening doesn't get you very far right the example that i love to tell people about is about our friend ramon who uh lives in mississippi and um after um trying to intimidate people who were going to worship at their local mosque ramon and his friends got some bubble guns from the dollar store you know, that just with soap create bubbles and just would come out and these guys would be out there with their signs and their Confederate flags and Ramon and folks would be out there with their bubbles. And it didn't even, couldn't piss them off because it's bubbles. So it just really kind of shifted the energy. It made the moth goers and the bystanders just feel like, that's my timer, uh, just feel like it was something that wasn't scary, that there wasn't going to be a conflict pop off because humor is, a, is really good medicine. And so to close us out, next slide, just want to remind you all to be humorous when you can be, be safe as much as you can be. Thank you so much for coming to my session and to the Frontlines track. And um, please stay in touch.